situation. Also, we have Dr. Keeti Iyengar, who is a National Program Officer at UNFPA New Delhi, and she will be speaking on abortion services during COVID-19 pandemic situation. I request all the attendees to uh, to send your questions during the sessions, and we will take up the sessions at the end of the uh, session. Thank you. Now I request Dr. Rimpi Singla uh, to start her session on family planning services during COVID-19 pandemic situation. Thank you. Am I audible? So this might lead to increase in unwanted pregnancy leading to safe and uh, leading to abortions. Many of them might be unsafe abortion. This will further lead to uh, the maternal mortality. So it's important to the, uh, realize the importance of contraception at this time. Dr. Rimpi, is there any issue? Uh, my, this thing is next slide is not moving. I'm not, I don't know why, but it's stuck. There are arrows on the side which you can use. Yeah, I've been using mom, but uh, I don't know, somehow it's, yeah. Okay, sorry yeah. for this interruption. So uh, the standard practice guideline that can be followed that all modern methods of contraception, whatever are available to us are equally safe during this COVID season. Alt but important is to have alternate strategies to counsel the patient and alternate strategies for deliveries. So the telemedicine is one approach where we can counsel the patient, the counsel the women for the contraception that, and uh, even we can see that whether they're eligible for a particular contraceptive method or not. And one more thing that the routine visits for like uh, implant follow-up or the IUCD follow-up, unnecessary, if they can be postponed, they should be better be postponed. And the frontline staff should be able to answer any small queries or they should be able to direct the questions to appropriate staff as needed in case of telemedicine is being used for these services. So the contraceptive can be, it's important to divide, it can be provider dependent, prescription dependent and over the counter. So for combined hormonal contraception, first of all, during telemedicine visit, we can rule out the medical contraindication. And if she has any documented blood pressure record that can be looked upon, or she can get a blood pressure done checked uh, over there in the local center and then can inform. And accordingly, we can decide whether she's eligible or we can on, on this uh, telemedicine only, we can ask for any uh, medical contraindications like uh, heart disease or anything or MI or any uh, uncontrolled hypertension, as I said. So if any contraindication exists, then she, uh, we can consider for alternative methods. So uh, such measures like the, the BMI and the blood pressure can be checked and communicated to the provider. But if the woman is using combined hormonal contraception, it is not necessary to review the blood pressure again so as to allow her to continue with the same method. We can safely provide her 12 month supply of the method that she has been using. We have to understand the risk of unplanned pregnancy is higher than the risk to be continued provided the baseline assessment record and the blood pressure and BMI at that initial visit was fine. For progesterone only pill, it is said to be generally safe. Rather, it is the bridging contraception for most of the contraceptive measures when they are changed from one to another. 
and uh, the for the already existing users so we can continue with them for 12 months at least and for the new seekers just we need to rule out the absolute contraindication that are like mbc3 and 4 of who long active reversible contraception for this the only thing that is documented is whether if where the services are available and we have the capacity to provide there is no reason to refuse them until unless it is we can say that the risk of you know pregnancy having its outweighs the risk of patient and the healthcare provider in providing these measures they are ideal if the concerns about especially if the concerns about adherence intolerance of oral contraceptives are there then it is this, this should be provided now for dmpa it is given every 13 weeks and if we are offering the routine visits then we can uh, provide that but if we are not offering we can assess the women for interest in other methods through telemedicine by phone she can switch to pop pills and uh, we can even provide her ocps if they are appropriate and face to face assessment is not necessary it is said generally if a woman is uh, not having any contraindication for dmp mostly they can safely have pops except that if there is issue with you know oral intake the com the compliance or she may, may not be able to adhere to the method in that case it can be an issue and for uh, it can uh, we can wait up to for two more weeks like it is uh, if it is up to 13 weeks it's recommended we can give a wait for another three weeks to, uh, if uh, we cannot provide her DMPA at that visit. For IUCDs, uh, the copper IOD, they have, uh, uh, the and the hormonal IUCDs, they are generally, these are recommended for five years, but if the woman is having LNG IUCD in situ, she can continue it safely for another year without using any other method. But beyond six years of usage, she need to have to switch over to another contraception. Maybe it's uh, oral hormone contraception or the barrier methods or whatever she wants to opt for. Important is that even if she is beyond six years of usage, she will need another contraception method. But it is not necessary to visit the healthcare facility just for the heck of removing the IUCD. It can very well be left in situ till we can have the you know optimal services for getting it removed and counsel that she should not try to remove such methods by herself and if the lng ius is being used for endometrial protection as a part of hrt then it, the she needs to switch over to some other method uh, at the expiry of five years and implants though they are not available they are uh, sh uh, it's uh, said that they can be continued for one more year and but after that she will need oral contraceptive or any other method now, this uh, Faculty of Reproductive and uh, Sexual Health, they have emphasized on one single visit contraception visit, uh, the method. It means providing immediate access to contraceptive method. Quick start for all methods, eliminate the requirements of multiple visits to initiate the method, the counseling, and then providing. The counseling and initiation of the client's method of choice in the single visit is encouraged. Especially, but this to rule or the has to be certain that the, the client is not pregnant. And we will provide the contraception in the same visit only if the client wants. She should not be coerced to have the contraception after counseling in the same visit if she does not want. Her preference should always be respected. Now, specifically for all the methods, for copper IUCDs, you can start anytime. Additional backup will not be required. An examination PSPV only if like you're suspecting the PID or in uh, the STIs. And LNG also you can start anytime. But uh, if the it's a uh, uh, if it is started within seven days of menses, you don't need any backup. If it is started after that, then you need a backup of seven days. For implant, the same guideline. For injectable, again it can be started anytime. If uh, it's less than uh, seven days of LMP then it can be given. If it is more than that, then she will need additional backup for seven days. For combined hormonal contraception, the same. If it is more than five days of menses, then she will need a backup. And the only requisite is that blood pressure should be normal. And for progesterone-only pill, if it is more than five days, then she will need a backup of two days. Now, as I said, that the, it should be certain that women is, if you are starting the contraceptive method within five days of periods, then it is fine. But after that, if your woman wants to start, 
how can we be reasonably certain that a woman is not pregnant first of all she should not be having any signs and symptoms and she will be meeting any one of the following criteria that is less than 7 days as i said and after that she has not had sexual intercourse since the start of last normal periods or she has been correctly and consistently using a reliable method of contraception she is less than 7 days after abortion she is within 4 weeks postpartum and she is fully breastfeeding amenorrheic and if it is if she is less than 4 6 months postpartum and if you are having any doubt you can go ahead with a urine pregnancy test or if the woman has come like the woman has come to you at day 10 of her cycle and she is asking you that doctor i want to start combined hormonal contraception pill but uh, like uh, if you are like she is saying you know i did not have any relation but you think you can always say okay fine you take the pill with you but if you think that you if you are like not ready to disclose you can take the pill you can go ahead you can uh, start the pill from the next cycle but she should not need, need to come back again to get the pill just because you are not sure of her pregnancy but definitely if there is any doubt of a client's pregnancy better not start in the same visit but you can provide and ask her to use another maybe condom maybe various other method till she gets the next period and after that she can start off now if the prescription or provider dependent methods are not accessible like she doesn't have an access to telemedicine she doesn't have access to the facility what can be done the barrier method they are available if with the correct usage they are very effective only 2% failure rate with the correct method and withdrawal technique and uh, the emergency uh, withdrawal method and emergency contraception it is generally available or uh, mostly available and if she is choosing an emergency contraception you can always counsel her she can always have another method uh, for contraception also along with when she takes the emergency contraception method for fertility awareness based method can be used during this period but they are like rhythm methods the standard method the basal body temperature and cervical change in cervical mucus if they are used correctly they are 99% effective but the problem is that if she is having irregular periods and she uh, the stis they may affect the signs of uh, this thing the cervical uh, mucus changes and medications that disrupt the cervical mucus production or if she has recently taken stop taking hormonal contraception or recently had abortion or postpartum or she is not able to take temperature as recommended or a drinker then and especially when you strictly don't want pregnancy maybe she is on some teratogenic drugs then it is not ideal the disadvantages during this covid season is that it is not the you know reliable time to you know learn this because it takes 3 to 6 month menstrual cycle to help the woman ideally derive her you know non fertilities she needs to keep a record of the signs and then the abstinence period can be you know it can be quite a long time then for that she may need to use any other method during those uh, the fertile times but uh, she definitely needs to learn over 3 to 6 menstrual cycle to define her days now postpartum family planning methods the effect it's recommended that a woman who has delivered in a facility she should be provided with effective contraception before discharge and this recommendation does not change during covid season immediate postpartum ppiucd uh, uh, should be provided if the woman desires and in recent in current circumstances their use should be restricted to the maternity centers which are currently providing to the women and most of the contraceptive method except they can be started safely and uh, but you can always uh, less than 3 weeks you are not going less than 4 uh, weeks you are not going to start with the progesterone pills so it is uh, you can provide them and then you can advise them to uh, her to start after 4 weeks and for lactation amenorrhea method it's uh, the recommendations the guidelines are exam exactly the same she should be fully uh, lactating uh, exclusive breastfeeding till 6 months and in case she has periods between that the, this method will not be effective so and she uh, the baby should be only exclusively on the breastfeed it is the frequent suckling that is important if she is not breastfeeding during the night time or she is using some other uh, top feeds during that time then it will not be reliable as now we have to understand this also because the later on as you know as the epidemic is evolving maybe she will not be able to get access to the other contraceptive methods so it is better to counsel her and provide her some other method of contraception maybe you can give her pops that if you are like uh, your uh, the baby is like six, less than 6 months and you 
uh, think that you are not exclusively breastfeeding, you can start off with POPs after six weeks of postpartum. And uh, sorry. Now for tubal sterilization, permanent sterilization method, they can be offered. Like if she's having a cesarean delivery, you can give her tubal sterilization, uh, tubal ligation at that time. But it is said that after vaginal delivery, the tubal ligation will be more of an elective procedure. It You are not going to deny if the patient is desiring that, but these decisions can be taken and on the, the local level at the uh, individual institute level. Now, as I said, eligible through telemedicine, through all these things, the WHO wheel is one thing that is going to help you in deciding the how you are going to counsel your couple for a particular contraceptive method. One, she can use this unrestricted. Number two, she, uh, the uh, category MEC category two, she can generally use that method. Category three, it's generally she should not use. And category four, it's not to be used. Now, if you are uncertain, should the category one and two, you can better it's go ahead, give it, and it is into three and four, better don't give. Now, um, this is the half of the wheel because, because I wanted to show all the details on this one. So uh, the first wheel, the first circle is uh, like this first circle is for IUCD. Then next one is for, as you can see, uh, the next one is for your LNG IUD, then for implant, then uh, DMP, then progesterone pills, and then CHC. A combined hormonal pill. So, grossly, if you see that for postpartum and breastfeeding, they have written it is four. And if it is like, if she's on some medications like uh, rifampicin or something, it is class three. So, for three and four, you can advise better not to use. And like your uh, the IUCD is most for most of the indications, it is category one, except when she's having PID or STIs where it becomes category three and four, depending upon whether she's having uh, uh, this, uh, the, uh, the, uh, if she's having uh, acute PID, then it is category four. If she's having increased risk of STI, then it is category three. And like this, you can use this wheel. It is very convenient to prescribe over the uh, telemedicine consultation, which method she should take. But when in doubt, it is better to uh, you know, like for hypertension, if you are not, the, your patient is saying, sometimes I have increased BP records and sometimes not, it is better to counsel for some other method. And uh, the general guiding principle, as I said, for category one and four, the guidelines are clear. For two and three, it is, uh, they, this needs a clear uh, clinical judgment. But during this uh, telemedicine visit, maybe you are not able to, so it is better it is categorized that if it is the clinical judgment is limited, then for one and two, the method can be used. For three and four, method should not be used. If there are many medical, there are many medical conditions for which they can use any uh, all the contraceptive methods. So uh, these are the various conditions. They are very much mentioned on the MEC wheel that for which all the methods are category one and two. Like for uh, benign uh, uh, the small fibroids, so she can use. Now, uh, this won't be complete without mentioning emergency contraceptive pills because many patients would be asking for that. Even if the woman has contraindication for combined hormonal pills and POPs, for emergency contraception, most of the categories, for most of the, disor uh, the disorders or any problem, the, uh, this uh, emergency contraception is either one or category two, except for IUCD, where uh, if, uh, if the patient is at got high risk of STI, then it is category three. If it is low risk for STI, then it is category two. Now WHO has uh, ans uh, on their website, they have answered for all the queries that are frequently asked by clients. Number one, all the modern methods of contraception are safe and effective, but the one, the best for you is the one that you, the best method of contraception for you is the one that works for you. You can access information and services by phone or online, but if you can, you can use the contraception, you can continue with your ongoing method of contraception, whatever you have been using. It is not necessary to visit for, you know, thread, checking the threads and all. And if at the end of expiry of the contraceptive, the lab method, you can wait for some more time, as I said earlier. And if you cannot have access to anything, the ideal use of condoms is a very good method that prevent, that protects you from additional thing that is STIs for which Again, you will not have to visit the healthcare facility. 
Now, there is one more problem, the challenges in making contraceptive method available and the solution thereof. So, uh, we are expecting the shortage of supplies. Many countries have voiced their concern on this uh, internet platform that the active uh, pharmaceutical ingredients of the contraception, most of them are produced in Asian countries and the China had been the leading uh, exporter of all these products. So they have shut down most of the plants. So there's going to be acute scarcity of hormonal methods. And uh, again, uh, there will be delay in packaging and there is heightened vigilance on export, import. So we are going to face, uh, we may face the shortage of the supplies. So for policymakers, it is important to have some strategies in place to enhance the access to information and contraceptive method. As in the very first slide I highlighted that we may, we may be seeing increased demand for abortions for unwanted pregnancies. And with the fear of visiting a hospital facility, they may be going for unsafe methods and again, increasing the risk for, you know, uh, the complications of unsafe abortion. And we have to, uh, for the policymakers, it is you can have a partnership with the private sector and we have to relax the restriction on the number of repeat issues. Like we have been giving OCPs for three months. So if the women has, doesn't have contraindication, we can provide for 12 months. We should, in uh, one, uh, the access to emergency contraception and postpartum and post-abortion contraception should be ensured. Healthcare facilities, it's important to have an inventory and monitor the utilization to better uh, avoid getting uh, out of stock. Now, this slide is very important. The UNP, UNFPA and Ministry of Health Family Welfare, the core message for contraceptive services is that the provision of modern short and long acting contraception, information counseling and services, it is life-saving and should be made available during this pandemic. Condoms, mala, chaya, antara, emergency contraception to be provided through all public healthcare facilities, including the ASHA workers and PHC and CHCs. Information about delayed availability of IUCD and sterilization services should be clearly displayed and beneficiaries must be considered about alternative methods because of this. So uh, this is one of the picture I found. Uh, this is uh, some uh, one district in Uttar Pradesh where the ANMs are actually going door to door and providing them. So there is, I mean, it's not actually difficult. We can provide contraceptive methods as they are actually, this article, they have elaborately said that when the, you know, the, your, uh, uh, the the daily wages they were like them they migrated back to their native states so the government took all these measures to provide them contraception at their door to prevent the complications of unwanted pregnancies so thank you I would say the one thing is stay home and stay safe I would say stay home safely thank you. Uh... Dr. Rimpi, uh, that was really very comprehensive session. I hope our attendees must have learned a lot and uh, the clear message is that we have to provide these services safely. So for the next session, I would like to invite Dr. Keithi Ayangar, who is a National Law Program Officer at UNFPA, to take her session on abortion services during uh, COVID-19 pandemic situation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Madhu, for organizing this webinar. Uh, I think Dr. Rimpi, you have to uh, unshare the screen before I can share. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, during this COVID pandemic, uh, one of the issues that very important issues that uh, Dr. Uh, Rimpi just now presented was about the contraception. As she very rightly said that lots of migra migrants have returned back to their villages. Otherwise, the migrants were there in the uh, cities for many months and they were coming to the villages only two to three months in the whole year. Now they are there long term. And with that, the contraception and abortion become very important issues. While everybody's attention is right now focused on how to, uh, you know, contain COVID, how to prevent COVID, and how to manage it if somebody gets through it. But we have to also keep in mind that we don't want one problem to be resolved, but we don't want to have other problems dropped up. And in that context, we are going to discuss the topics of family planning and abortion. So I'm going to briefly talk about the uh, issue of abortion access and safety with the COVID situation. So first of all, before I start, I just wanted to clarify that UNFP's position on abortion is twofold. One is that we do not promote abortion. We accord highest priority to the availability of the family planning services. 
to prevent unintended pregnancies in order to eliminate the recourse to abortion number 2 our aim is to help the government strengthen their health system to deal effectively with the complications of unsafe abortion because we do not want any maternal deaths due to unsafe abortion and we also support that wherever abortion is legal the national health system should make it safe and accessible and as you all know in india abortion has been legal for more than 40 years so uh, one of the very important questions is how does the provid influence the need for reproductive health care so uh, it appears that because of the whole crisis women will have a greater need for the reproductive health care because they'll have to take decisions about preventing pregnancies now during the provid situation when they are not sure whether you know somebody uh, her husband may have returned and he might be in quarantine period so whether a pregnancy has to be continued or not they may have other health concerns and very very importantly as we all know many many people millions of people in india have lost their jobs and there is economic insecurity at a certain time like this does anybody want to continue with the pregnancy and to bring up one more child uh, and last but not the least what we have been hearing is that the cases of domestic violence have increased because now there are like various issues because of which the cases of domestic violence have increased and women may be in lesser position to decide to say no to sex now the point is because of this provid uh, provid crisis does it restrict the access to contraception and safe abortion services so the clear answer is yes because one is the people's ability to pay for services everywhere we know very well that the uh, abortion services are not available in public health system all the time some several times people have to go to private health services and number 2 sometimes they are not able to reach the uh, free services and they have to buy for example if they have to buy a condom or oral pill they have to buy from a chemist shop now our doctors and nurses their attention is right now focused much more on uh, responding to covid and they may not be available to provide contraception and safe abortion then there are issues of quarantine and most importantly travel restriction people are not able to travel for their other health conditions because the police may ask you why are you going and to say that i'm going for an abortion may not be the easiest things and who's affected most the poorest and the most marginalized women and girls are affected the most now uh, there is a very well renowned institute called ratmatter institute in uh, usa and they have recently estimated the potential impact of covid 19 pandemic on sexual and reproductive health in the low and middle income countries and what they have found is their estimate is that even if there is just a 10% decline in the use of short acting contraceptives it will mean that we have 15 million additional unwanted pregnancies the other is that if there is a 10% decline in the service coverage of the essential pregnancy related and you want here there are likely to be almost uh, 1.75 million additional women who will have obstetric complications which do not receive care because women are not able to reach the facility in time there will be 28000 additional maternal deaths and then they have estimated that 10% of abortions might shift from safe abortion to unsafe abortion which will mean that in the world we'll have about 3.3 million additional unsafe abortions so we can estimate that the number of people who will have unwanted pregnancies and unsafe abortions and if they continue with the pregnancy then there are a risk of obstetric complications and maternal deaths so we should be very serious about this issue so before we go on to the covid situation very briefly i wanted to tell you the situation in india for abortion services as you all probably very well know that in situa- the uh, a very well known study which has been published in the lancet in 2016 has shown that the estimated number of abortions in india is around 15.6 million and it has been estimated that one third of all the pregnancies in india end in abortions and public sector is responsible for 5% of all abortions the same study also shows that out of these 15.6 million abortions about 81% of all the abortions are medical 14% are surgical and 5% are other other would be the other methods which could be unsafe methods now in terms of the sources of medical abortion it has been shown that among the medical abortion about 91% is sourced from outside the facilities which means it could be a chemist shop or some other place uh and uh, public and private facilities have a <clears throat> total roll of about 9% among the sources of surgical abortions about 75% are taken from the private facilities and about 25% for from public facilities but overall if you combine the medical and surgical 
the public sector is responsible for 5% of abortions. And in a way, there are a few barriers that we create in the public sector, and that is the reason, part of the reason that women land up going to the premises. Now, uh, there is also this very interesting data about the gap between the sales of Mifepristone in India and the number of reported liberal abortions. So the sales of uh, Mifepristone in India is around uh, more than 16 billion per year, while the number of reported liberal abortions is only 7 lakhs per year. So in this chart, we can see the huge gap. And uh, this is what explains that large numbers of women are, have, are basically interested in medical abortion and they are uh, treating it from other sources. Now, in terms of the access to safe abortion, we have, first of all, in many, many rural areas, there are no MTP uh, trained providers are available. In many, many PHCs, it's estimated that only 4% of PHCs have any uh, MTP service available. Uh, and even where the trained providers are available, there are various, various issues like privacy, confidentiality, requirement that the woman should undergo sterilization on the same visit, or various other problems, because of which uh, women are not able to get the services, and sometimes they want medical abortion. If somebody can get some you know, easier method, but they are told to go through a surgery, they may not prefer it. In one of the uh, service settings, one of the studies, it, it was found that when the choice between medical and surgical abortion was offered, gradually majority of the women shifted from surgical, you can see how the surgical has been declining and how the medical has been increasing. So now I'm going to briefly talk about how can we uh, minimize the COVID exposure for women and staff while providing abortion services and what can, what can be done for women who have suspected or confirmed COVID and want an abortion? So for minimize, minimizing the COVID exposure for women and staff, uh, one is that very important issue that comes to the mind is, is it necessary to provide the safe abortion services? As we just now heard that if we don't provide safe abortion services, either women will continue with the pregnancy and seven, eight or seven, eight months down the line, we'll have to deal with a much bigger problem, which is deliveries. And uh, the other is that it's a very time sensitive service and it's crucial. And uh, even the government of India, WHO, everybody uh, has recommended that this service should be maintained even when other non-urgent services are suspended. As we know that elective surgeries, there is a suggestion that they should be suspended, but not about abortion. Now, what happens if we, if we say, okay, let, we'll delay by two, three months, we can do it for other services. If somebody needs some other elective surgery, we can say, okay, delay by three, four months. But we can't do that for abortion because we know very well that there will be an increase in the gestational age. Then suppose a woman today is eligible for medical abortion, she may not be eligible uh, one month or even two months down the line. And then we will create a further strain on the hard press, hard press surgical ser uh, services. Now, in the situations where the safe abortion services are not provided, women land up going to various traps. These are some of the traps. And this, you know, all of you, if you know Hindi, you can see that this is a, a news newspaper clipping about how a woman's condition became very bad after a trap pulled out her intestine. So we don't want such situations. Therefore, better to provide her the safe abortion services. Now, we all know that we have medical and surgical methods of abortion. Now, which is better? Now, what should a provider do if a woman has an unwanted pregnancy in today's time and she wants abortion? And I'm talking of the women who are non covid who are absolutely normal women, who have no symptoms of COVID, no contact history, nothing. Now, we try and provide MTP as per the legal guidelines, as per the MTP Act. And it is recommended that women from the rural areas should try to go to the facilities where we, which are nearer to their houses, like a PHC or CHC or even a private clinic, rather than come in very far away to a medical college or a district level hospital. And they should preferably go to the facilities where medical services are also available, medical abortion services. Now, uh, why we are saying that the medical abortion might be more suitable, the surgical can also be provided. But as you probably know that surgical abortion requires a certain level of skill, a certain levels of analgesia to be provided, and it generally needs a slightly bitter level of facility. While the medical abortion, which requires a few pills to be driven, and which can easily be provided up to nine weeks as per MTP Act, and it can even be provided at a PHC level. And what is a still needed by a doctor? See, for surgical abortion, the doctor should be trained in uterine evacuation. While for medical abortion, they basically need the skill of gestational age estimation. Because if we look at the checklist of medical abortion, 
the most important still is to assess the gestational age based on the pelvic examination. And of course, in India, a doctor to be MTP trained requires a equal duration of training, but we know that several doctors are not feeling very confident after that training, uh, after receiving the MTP training, they don't feel confident about performing the MBA, but they may feel confident about providing medical abortion services. But the other point is, does medical abortion allow for shorter duration of contact between the woman and provider? Yes, to a certain extent, yes, because there is a less contact of various surfaces of the woman with the surfaces. And then the duration of the hospital stay. When the woman goes for a surgical abortion, she has to go about one to two hours before for the, some, you know, so that some analgesics can be driven. Then she has to lie down in the OT, even if it's a minor OT or a outpatient room. And then even after the procedure, we have to keep for an hour or two. So it becomes a total of minimum three to five hours of hospital stay. While for medical abortion, we need lesser duration of stay. There is no need for any analgesia. And at, at least up to nine weeks, we can offer it as a choice to the woman. Now, uh, in India, uh, many providers have apprehensions about given a choice to women between medical and surgical abortion. Some of them think that medical abortion is a dangerous procedure and there is a risk of severe hemorrhage at unexpected hours. While the reality is not the same, medical abortion has been identified as one of the most important reproductive health technologies of 21st century. And uh, it is considered to be very, very safe because it does not have any risk of a uterine perforation. And the risk of uh, incomplete abortion is only in four to 5%. And all of them do not really need a uh, you know, blood transfusion or anything that is needed in less than 0.1% women. The other reason is that I have heard several doctors say it is that we can't insert an IUD or provide a sterilization service at the same visit. And therefore, we would prefer to give her surgical abortion. That's a very important reason. But we should remember that women prefer a less uh, a clinical procedure and therefore they are going to private clinics or they are going to the premise shops. But one other thing that we have to remember is that with the medical abortion, uh, some, you know, earlier 20, 30 years ago, the service delivery protocol required uh, was a little more complicated, but now it has been simplified. Some people for the eligibility assessment do a routine ultrasound, which is not really needed unless one suspects a uh, ectopic pregnancy. And uh, some of the protocols require that she comes three times. And uh, so I just wanted to also, uh, you know, run you through this uh, WHO guidance, which has come in 2019 on medical abortion. And uh, basically, I would suggest that you pay attention to these charts in yellow, which says that for induced abortion, less than 12 weeks, uh, medical abortion can be driven, mifepristone and isoprostol. And even for induced abortion, above 12 weeks also, uh, mifepristone and misoprostol is, uh, is safe. However, in India, we have to follow the MTP Act, which basically allows medical abortion to be provided only up to nine weeks of gestation. Uh, so, reduced numbers, what has been found by research over the last many years, which has a very uh, lots of implications for providing care during the COVID time, and says that reduced number of visits for medical abortion are possible. We can simplify the protocols. So, even there has been a recent RCOG guideline on providing safe abortion services during the COVID times, which has very clearly said that ultrasound is not needed routinely. And even the blood tests are not routinely needed. If we suspect that she is anemic, yes, we must, we must do it. But otherwise, it's not really routinely needed. <clears throat> then regarding the number of visits, we have to consider that misoprostol can be driven for home use. In fact, many people have been driven for home use. Uh, but some people, they strictly request that the woman should come three times. Now, it is the provider's decision. But overall, it has been found that under you know, you, lots of conditions, the misoprostol can be safely driven for home use. And the follow-up visit, which is generally needed at the clinic on the day 7 to 14, can be substituted by alternatives. Now, uh, why alternatives? Because we all know that the follow-up rate after medical abortion is already low. Women who have a, a complete abortion, who have absolutely no complications or problems, they sometimes don't come back for a follow-up visit. And sometimes when they then when they go, 
then uh, sometimes the doctors do unnecessary interventions like ultrasounds. And if the ultrasound shows any small little preterm products, then they recommend a MBA procedure. Now, uh, as we know that medical abortion is more like a spontaneous abortion, and sometimes there can be a small little preterm product even at seven days, which will probably get expelled in the next two to three days. So the main purpose, as per the international literature for doing a follow-up visit is to detect an ongoing pregnancy. It means whether it's a failed abortion. And the prevalence of that is 0.5 to 1%. But we are for detecting, for, uh, detecting this 0.5 to 1% women, we are rolling the rest also. And therefore, it has been recommended that there are low sensitivity pregnancy tests. And also, even telephonic consultation can help you to understand whether woman has had a complete abortion or not. Now, what about MTPs above nine weeks? If the woman is nine weeks or above, then of course we have to provide surgical abortion with proper precautions. However, we have to make sure that woman does not bring many visitors with her. The visitors have to be minimum. And of course we have to follow all the, the precautions like the social distancing. And what about the spontaneous abortion services? Uh, in spontaneous abortion, we have to provide prayer to all the women who are coming within complete abortion, missed abortion or in inevitable abortion as before. And abortion is a time sensitive service and we should organize the service uh, as early as possible. Now, this I already spoke about that sometimes we do impose some unnecessary barriers, but during the COVID times when people are having economic hardships uh, and also the risk of any complication or death related to a full term pregnancy is much higher than a simple early abortion. I'm not saying that we go for late abortion, but early abortion generally before nine weeks or even a first trimester safe abortion is much safer than a uh, delivery. So, but uh, several providers do create barriers like lack of privacy and confidentiality, lack of choice of methods. Sometimes they made it a precondition to provide it only if the woman agrees for sterilization or IUD. Sometimes they ask for consent from family members, which we all know it is not needed under the MPP Act. Sometimes the service is not driven to unmarried people, even if they are above 18 years. We know that 18 years or below, uh, 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 it's a minor and they have to be accompanied by a Rajan. But for unmarried girls who are coming above the age of 18 years, we don't have to ask for a family consent, but that is sometimes uh, provided, asked for. So, and services are not provided to women coming alone. Now here, especially if the woman and the doctor say that, okay, if there is a complication, who's responsible? Now just think about providing medical abortion. Somebody does an eligibility assessment, just like we do a PV if a woman was coming for any other condition. And then what she has to do is she has to take a pill of mifepristone. And in the next 48 hours, actually nothing is going to happen most likely. She's not going to start bleeding. So uh, many people have said that actually medical abortion pill is safer than many other pills which are driven. And you know, Vidra, which is available over the counter is also far more riskier. But people uh, do demand that woman has, should have somebody to accompany her, which is not really needed. Now, this is the RCOG guideline on uh, COVID and abortion prayer, which says that if there is a woman with suspected or confirmed COVID, then how do we provide abortion services? So here the management is decided by the obstetrician and the COVID-19 team. Now, when we say COVID-19 team, generally it will mean an infectious disease specialist. So if the woman has been in isolation because her family contact is positive, suppose somebody else in her family is positive, she herself is not positive, but she's in isolation because someone else in her close family is positive, then preferably the MTP should be deferred till the isolation period is over. However, if her duration of pregnancy is such that we don't want to defer it, then we should provide it, us provide it using uh, all the precautions. Now, if the woman is COVID positive herself and needs an MTP, then the recommendation is if it's a very early pregnancy, then the MTP should be delayed till the woman is cured and isolation period is over. However, if MTP cannot be delayed by two to three weeks, then the prayer will be provided in a COVID prayer center or COVID hospital with full IPC precautions. Now, I uh, already, I think Dr. Rimpi has told you about the ministry's guidelines on the management of pregnancy during COVID. And this was released on the 14th of April and uh, so it has some sections on the family planning services and safe abortion services. So I'll not talk of the first two bullets which uh, refer to the family planning services, but the third bullet refers to the safe abortion service, which says that the medical and surgical abortion services should be ensured at the appropriate facility level. 
with appropriate infection prevention measures, including counseling for post-abortion care and provision of contraception. Now, also wanted to let you know that basically this is a ministry's guideline, and there are WHO which says that safe abortion is a uh, essential service, and there are other guidance materials from WHO and various other agencies, and as I said, even RCOG. And this presentation has been prepared on the basis of those guidance. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kirti. Uh, this was really useful, and uh, I'm sure this is neglected area, but definitely what we have learned is that family planning services and abortion services can be given to the woman in COVID-19 uh, pandemic situation as well. So uh, now we can uh, move to uh, the panel discussion, and uh, we have some questions from the participants. We will take up that first. So uh, one of the participants uh, is uh, actually asking if we can do something about the sale of mifepristone and misoprostol over the counter. If uh, we can do something, so, uh, I may pose this question to Dr. Kirti. If are there any regulations, can we uh, reduce the sale? Yeah, actually there are regulations and this cannot be provided over the counter. And this should not be provided. It should be provided only on the prescription of a doctor who is MTP certified. And uh, the drug controller of the each state keeps a watch on the unregulated sales. And uh, it has been implemented uh, in some of the states very strictly. And uh, in some of the places, it is not uh, kept so much, uh, like this is not uh, regulated as strictly, but it should be, uh, we should not allow the over-the-counter sales. Uh, but the thing, it is being provided, yeah, because it is not, the rules are not being implemented probably, uh, properly. That is the issue in India, but uh, definitely there are regulations which can control this. Like in Chandigarh, uh, it is not easily available. So, uh, yeah, I, the, the participant is saying, uh, I think this is Dr. Meena. She's asking that the other day I got a patient in shock because she probably has taken it over the counter. And I think the awareness is also required uh, for the patients also that it could be risky to their life. Yes, definitely. So moving on to the next question. Uh, so in the panelists, if I can uh, request all the panelists kindly, please uh, switch on your videos and audios. So we also have Dr. Nina Singla, who's retired as head of department of government multi-specialty hospital in Chandigarh. And she was also uh, assistant director uh, with Punjab. So uh, there is this question. Uh, I think Dr. Uh, uh, Rimpi can answer this. Is medical method of abortion is safe in cases of previous LSCS or Dr. Kirti, yeah, because it's related to abortion. Um, so, yeah, okay. yeah uh, previous months certain section, uh, yes, the medical method can very much be offered. And for previous two, so, uh, there with the same um, fibristone and mesoprostol we are using here for one previous one abortion. And if it is previous two abortion, then you have to individualize, especially we have to see the gestational age. And you have to see maybe she, she's in second trimester. So we have uh, this thing, uh, the, uh, you can induce with the pitocin and you can, uh, if uh, the patient is desirous of uh, having a hysterotomy, that is also one option. But for previous one cesarean section, the medical method can be offered uh, as in previous one, uh, as in unscarred uterus also. Okay, so uh, thank you, Dr. Rimpi. Uh, so there are questions I would request Dr. Nina to respond. Uh, uh, there's a question on PPIUCD. I think Dr. Uh, Pimpi has covered uh, in his session also uh, regarding PPIUCD in a COVID positive patient, whether we should be inserting uh, PPIUCD or not. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Madhu. Uh, the, this question has been coming uh, uh, up again and again. Uh, I think... Uh, um, uh, as we have already discussed that uh, rate of abortions is going to increase and uh, the unwanted pregnancies is also going to increase. So it is a duty to provide uh, uh, whatever contraceptives we can to the patient at whatever, whenever we have a visit from the patient, if she's asking for it or uh, if she has already expressed her desire for it. And if she has already given her uh, consent for the PPIUCD uh, during her antenatal period, and she turns out to be COVID-19 positive. If she is asymptomatic or she is, has just mild symptoms, so uh, there is no problem in uh, inserting a PPIUCD. Rather, it should be inserted. She should be given that contraception and then sent home. Thank you. So uh, are, there's a next question. These are ego guidelines. Ego guidelines. Yeah. yeah, thank you. 
There's a next question. Can a clinically stable patient with COVID-19 undergoing caesarean section be provided with tubectomy as well? Dr. Rimpi, uh, uh, this question. Tubal ligation are same as they were in the non-COVID time. If your patient is undergoing caesarean section, if she opts for tubal ligation, it can very well be provided. Again, the same protocol exists, the same uh, the checklist, the eligibility criteria, they again remain the same. We can provide. But if it is like uh, during cesarean, yes, very well. But after normal delivery, you have to individualize. If you are uh, mostly it is said it is an elective procedure, it can very well be deferred in this pandemic season. You can offer or alternate also. But if the woman insists she wants to get it done, there is no as such contraindication. Yes, we cannot. Not like that. Even in COVID positive also, you can uh, give it. If the woman insists. Uh, in a COVID uh, positive patient, if she's undergoing yeah. cesarean, we can provide. But if it is not like after normal, normal. delivery, no, no. In after normal delivery, it is better to avoid. It is definitely avoid. better to avoid. Thank you. Uh, the next question is: uh, What method of con contraception can we provide for immediate contraceptive protection, other than condoms, to a post-delivery woman with COVID-19 positive status? Uh, as such, if you see, there are no uh, set guidelines for a COVID positive patient for contraception because there is hardly any data available. But through all the available literature that has been published on since the onset of this, they say that there is nothing specifically contraindicated for during this uh, for, for this uh, during this COVID uh, season. For especially for a COVID positive. Yes, uh, the no, the routine contraception that I've been providing to other women. So they can be provided uh, the same to those also. So it's not like, especially except for the, like the, when the exposure is more, like for tubal ligation, as you said. So if it is after normal delivery, it is better to avoid that. But for the other contraception, hmm. yeah, but for other contraception like uh, IUCD, so if the your center is already providing BP IUCD, and the patient is like, uh, as Dr. Kirti said, so if she's uh, like uh, just positive and it, she's not having any uh, other major illness, so like she's not having uh, the, she's not uh, unwell because of, just because of the positivity. If she wants to have, she can have. PPIC, that can be provided. But if the patient is running fever, like she has delivered, now she's having fever. So it is not exactly you cannot, you like she's undergone a labor of 16, 18 hours. And now she's having fever. Fever itself is a contraindication for providing PPIOCD. So that becomes, you know, you have to individualize your each and every case. But mm -hmm. as such, this is a COVID positive patient. I'm going to give this contraception to her and I'm not going to give this contraception to her. It's not like that. The guidelines are same for both of them. Okay, thank you. So uh, there's another question to Dr. Keithi. Uh, can we provide long acting reversible contraceptives to a woman who has undergone surgical abortion and is COVID positive? Yeah, so uh, as such, if the woman has undergone surgical abortion, then she can be provided any contraceptive because as we know, the trovit uh, transfers through the respiratory uh, route. So it is not going to be transmitted through other routes. And therefore, it is all right to provide her uh, an IUD or suppose she wants a DMP injection. In India, we do not have implants available but IUD or DMP can be provided. However, the ministry's health uh, guidelines also say that the post-abortion contraceptive can be provided. Uh, even post-abortion IUCD is fine. Uh, but the interval IUCDs, they have said it is better to defer at the moment. So mm -hmm. there is no problem in providing the long reptile reversible contraceptives. Or even, and a, even yeah. yeah, even after medical abortion as well, like this was a case of surgical abortion, mm -hmm. but even after medical abortion, yeah, even what? after medical abortion, the contraceptive can be provided. In fact, if we suppose we want to reduce the number of visits, uh, the WHO recommends that even on the day one, even on the day of Mifepristone, the, uh, even the DMPA can be provided. So if we are worried that the woman will not use a contraceptive, then at least we can counsel her well and we can either hand over uh, other methods like the oral pills, condoms, uh, such methods, or we can give her a DMPA dose and before she leaves the clinic. And if suppose she is going to come back for uh, either a follow-up visit, then certainly at that time, again, we can provide it. So after medical abortion, any method can be provided. Yes, uh, I want to add on like uh, for the IUCD, especially after abortion, if it's a medical method, then it has the, uh, that for this thing, the, the uterine cavity should be clear. 
So just as we are discouraging a visit or follow up just for checking that the abortion process is complete, so we don't need to have, we should not rather have a visit just for having an IUCD. So for rest of the things, as you have said, ma'am, that it is like uh, with the, with the Mifepristone visit itself, we can start the hormonal method. Yeah, that's better, I think, with that visit if you can give injection at that time. That's a good opportunity. So I uh, one last question is that whether uh, ASHAs can go in the community, in the village level, to uh, to conduct pregnancy tests because uh, there could be delay in identifying pregnancy and delay in the option of having medical abortions if it's an unwanted pregnancy. So this is, I think, very important, relevant uh, public health questions. So Dr. Keithi, I would request you to respond to this. Yeah, so government has said that uh, the guidelines to ASHAs and ANMs that they should try to carry all the contraceptives with them and also the pregnancy test kits. So that, uh, and it also makes sense because so that people don't have to come out of their houses just for these services. Why should a woman go to a health center like a PHC or a private hospital just to get her uh, pregnancy test done while she can easily get it at home? So uh, as uh, actually home delivery of contraceptives and home delivery of pregnancy test kits is encouraged by the ministry. And they have also been of the view that okay, if the ASHA is not able to reach your house, they can, uh, women can go to the chemist shop, whichever is the nearest from their house to get this. So ASHAs, in fact, uh, it is good if ASHAs are able to protect themselves because they are already growing house to house for the purpose of corona related work. So they can also carry contraceptives and the pregnancy test kits. So we can definitely ensure uh, reproductive, sexual and reproductive health services in COVID-19 pandemic situation. I think this is a big message from this webinar. I hope you must have learned a lot from our panelists. Uh, thank you so much. I thank all the panelists for joining us and all the participants for listening to this webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.